Hi, everyone. Happy Independence Day to all those of you who are in the United States, from the United States, or maybe you're just celebrating it with us. The message that I want to share with you in this video is regarding freedom and what God says we must continue to do in order to have freedom, in order to continue to enjoy freedom. In Leviticus 26, God talks about blessings for obedience and punishment for disobedience. And throughout the Bible, he warns us that if we do not obey him, if we do not continue to return to him, obey his Sabbath, and observe his commands and decrees, we will no longer be free. And I've told you so many times that God uses a tangible, physical object in order to teach us spiritual symbolism. And he has indeed sent his people into captivity many times for disobedience. And we see in the Bible that when his people went into captivity, they knew what they needed to do. Why? Because God says, when I send these things, when I do these things, if my people who are called by my name will turn to me. So when he sends those things, we're supposed to know, one, that he sent them, and two, that we need to return, that we've gotten too far from him. And if we don't, we go into bondage. We go into captivity. And a lot of people interpret this as he's a terrible God. I don't want to believe in that wrathful God. But we need to understand that spiritual bondage is worse than any physical bondage that God could ever use in order to bring us low, in order to bring us into submission. It's kind of a weird time in history right now. And as I'm sitting here reflecting on this holiday that we're celebrating in the United States of independence, I can't help but reflect on what we have done in this country with our freedom, with the freedom that God blessed us with. And I said the other day that in, a video, in one of the videos that I uploaded, I said that um, this country was a country that was founded on Puritan Christian values. And someone uh, commented and said uh, that the founding fathers were Freemasons. And, um, and they're, they're right. Some of the founding fathers were Freemasons. Nevertheless, I don't actually believe that any man or group of men founded this country. I believe that God set this country apart as a place for people to come and worship him, to escape the religious persecution of the harlot Catholic Church and be able to return to him and worship him. How many times did God say to Pharaoh, let my people go so that they can worship me? And God prepared a place. He founded a place where his people could go and worship him. And yeah, there's a whole lot of the world in America. But our Declaration of Independence acknowledged a creator. Doesn't matter who those men were. It doesn't matter because God will use whoever he's going to use. Our country was founded on the idea that there is a creator and it was set apart as a place where people could re escape religious persecution and they could come and worship God with religious freedom. The way that God has commanded us to worship him. And I'm reminded of when the Greeks took over the second temple and they removed religious freedom from God's people. They were not allowed to observe Sabbath. They were not allowed to read the Torah. They were forced to engage in the pagan practices of the Greeks. And even some of them became Hellenistic Jews, Jews who maintained certain practices of the Greeks, pagan practices. And the people weren't bothered by it. They were okay becoming part of the world. They were okay adapting the world into what God established. Sound familiar? But there was a group of Jews called the Maccabees, and they fought and they reclaimed God's temple. They cared enough to rededicate God's temple and to restore it to the purity of his word and his commands. And it was because of those Jews, because of true Jews, that the people were spared. 
And God says, when I send these things, if my people, not the world, not counterfeit Christians, if my people who are called by my name will turn and seek my face and humble themselves and turn from their wicked ways, I will restore them. I will heal them. I will heal their land. They're the only ones or the only reason why anything is being held back, why destruction is being held back. And remember that God said he was going to destroy Sodom. And Abraham said, if I can find 50 righteous people, will you spare this city? And God said, okay, I'll spare the, peop- I'll spare the city if you can find 50 righteous people. And then Abraham came back and he said, God, don't be mad at me. (laughs) How about five less than 50? And God said, okay, for 45, if you can find 45 righteous people, I will spare the city. And Abraham came back and he said, "Uh, what if only 40 are found there? And God said, for the sake of 40, I'll not do it. I'll not destroy the city. And Abraham came back and said, may the Lord not be angry, but let me speak. What if only 30 can be found there? And God said, I will not do it if I find 30 there. Abraham came back and said, now that I've been so bold as to speak to the Lord, what if only 20 can be found there? And God said, for the sake of 20, I will not destroy it. And Abraham said again, may the Lord not be angry, but let me speak just once more. What if only 10 can be found there? And God said, for the sake of 10, I will not destroy it. God holds back for the sake of his people. But there also comes a point when he sees his people in such grief and they're calling out to him in prayer and they're lamenting the sickening, detestable things that are done in his church in his temple, among his people, in Jerusalem, in Israel, in Zion, the nation set apart to be holy, his holy people. And he has to vindicate them. He has to vindicate them. He has to move things along. And so he sends his witnesses, his prophets, his servants, to warn of the destruction that's going to come. And most of the time, the people don't listen. Most of the time... They kill his prophets, and we know that's going to happen. But we also know that during the time that his witnesses are testifying, he's going to start harming the earth. He's already had his witnesses here. They've been calling people in. I've been telling you in the last couple weeks that people are falling. They're turning away. They're turning back to the vomit. They don't really have a heart for God. They're putting their hand to the plow, but they're looking back, insulting the spirit of grace. And being too connected to this world. He proves himself to them, but they don't really actually want to prove themselves to him. It's too hard. It's too hard to pick up their covenant. It's too hard to live out their faith in the way that he has said we must live out our faith. Giving up everything to follow him. Picking up our daily cross. I've been telling you that this is happening. I've been telling you that the witnesses are here, that they are calling people in and people are not listening. They don't take his word seriously. They don't take his prophets seriously. So what is God going to do? He's going to start harming the earth. He sends his witnesses. They don't listen. He starts harming the earth. And I can guarantee you that when he does that, most are still not going to listen because we already know that. We already know that it says that in the word. There is a remnant that no one can count that are going to come out of the great tribulation. The great tribulation, by the way, is God's wrath. It's the first about 45 days of God's wrath. The reason we know that it's 45 days is because in Daniel it says, From the time that the abomination of desolation is set up, which is what incites God's jealous wrath, is 1,290 days. Blessed is the one who reaches 1,335 days. So it's about 45 days of God's great wrath 
that people are going to be here to endure. It's going to pass over God's people, but they're going to be here. They will have had to refuse the mark of the beast. They will have had to refuse bowing down to Baal. I'm warning you very clearly of the times that we're living in right now. I'm telling you that this is what's going on right now. The witnesses are here. The trumpets are about to blow. They are coming. God is going to begin harming the earth. This freedom that we have enjoyed in the United States because God set this place apart for his people to have somewhere to come and worship him. And he has relented only because of his people who have a heart for him. That is why this nation has continued to be blessed. It's the only reason why. Because God founded this place for us to be able to worship him. That's what he wanted. Obedient children who truly have a heart for him, who worship him in truth and in spirit, who obey his Sabbaths, his commands, and his decrees who assemble as the body of Christ and glorify him and praise him and worship him. He had mercy on his people because they had been through so much oppression and persecution as a result of the Catholic Church. And what have we done? What are we doing? Our president doesn't even mention God on the day of prayer. They let prayers be lifted up to the false god Brahma in our nation's capital. False prophets are being brought into churches to prophesy a word over people that has to do with the world. Wealth is your portion. Speaking worldliness over people who should be, if, they, if God wants to give someone a blessing, he's going to tell you directly if you're listening to him. He doesn't send prophets to do that. He sends prophets to warn, but everyone's running to those services because they're bringing in the false prophet again. Maybe he'll have a word for me. No one's concerned. No one's concerned about the filth that's being brought into God's church, into his temple, into his nation that was called to be holy to him. No one's concerned that we're observing a Sunday Sabbath when God established Sabbath on Saturday. No one's concerned that God's holy days are first of all not being observed and second of all have been replaced with pagan holidays. No one's concerned about these ideas, you know, such as what Pope Francis says, that homosexuals should be integrated into society, not marginalized. And by society, he means the church. That is the attitude that he's telling the church to have, even though he is not the spokesperson for the church, because Catholicism is not the church, but this is an attitude that the church has adapted. We're more concerned about not offending the world than we are about offending our God. God did not create any of his creations to be homosexual, quote unquote homosexual. It's not a condition. It's not a condition of his design. So call it what it is, sexually immoral. And we are not supposed to be joining a prostitute with the body of Christ. No one is supposed to be holding positions in the church who is engaging in anything like that, in any sexual immorality. We have a Roman Catholic president who is fighting for abortion, for the murder of unborn babies to be sacrificed on the altar of Baal and passed through the fire. He's fighting for that. He's grieved that Roe versus Wade was overturned. He's calling for codifying Roe versus Wade, rewriting it so that it's re-implemented. I mean, there's so much more happening, right? Revelation 2 through 3 tells us all of the things that are happening, all of the things that would happen in God's church. And you know what? The world has always been disgusting. But for God's people to go along with this and think that this is okay and get comfortable in the world is sickening. But they're not listening to the witnesses. So what's going to happen next? God is going to start harming the earth. And then 
most people still will not return. Most people, no doubt, will turn to the science God to tell them what will happen, to tell them what we need to do. They won't turn to God, even though he says, when I send these things, return to me and I'll heal you. And so we know why they're going to be here during the latter half of the seven-year period. We know why they're going to be here for the Antichrist reign because they will be handed over to the spirit they have chosen because that is what God does. He doesn't give grief willingly, but look how he started. He started by giving them a word, giving them commands, telling them, when you see these things, this is what I'm doing. Understand, you need to return to me. When I make you sick, when I send wasting disease to your body, when I start harming the earth. But no, those things are not relevant anymore, right? What God says is not relevant anymore because we have science now. Science will cure it. Science, by the way, pharmacia, by the way, were considered magic arts. And it says in Revelation that even though God sends all these things, people will still curse him and continue in their, what? Their magic arts. I hope that no matter where you are in the world, whether you're in the United States or not, that you'll take a moment to really examine where you are with God. If you need to return, then return. He won't turn away anyone who comes to him. If you need to return, return. Isaiah chapter 5, I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press as well. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. Now you dwellers in Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could I have done for my vineyard than I have done for it? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? Now I will tell you what I'm going to do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge and it will be destroyed. I will break down its wall and it will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland, neither pruned nor cultivated and briars and thorns will grow there. I will command the clouds not to rain on it. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the nation of Israel and the people of Judah and the vines he delighted in. And he looked for justice, but saw bloodshed for righteousness, but he heard cries of distress. Woe to you who add house to house and join field to field till no space is left and you live alone in the land. The Lord Almighty has declared in my hearing, surely the great houses will become desolate, the fine mansions left without occupants. A 10 acre vineyard will produce only a bath of wine. A omer of seed will yield only an ephah of grain. Woe to those who rise early in the morning to run after their drinks, who stay up late at night till they are inflamed with wine. They have harps and lyres at their banquets, pipes and timbrels and wine, but they have no regard for the deeds of the Lord, no respect for the work of his hands. Therefore, my people will go into exile for lack of understanding. Those of high rank will die of hunger and the common people will be parched with thirst. Therefore, death expands its jaws, opening wide its mouth. Into it will descend their nobles and masses with all their brawlers and revelers. So people will be brought low and everyone humbled, the eyes of the arrogant humbled. But the Lord Almighty will be exalted in his, by his justice and the holy God will be proved holy by his righteous acts. Then sheep will graze as in their own pasture. Lambs will feed among the ruins of the rich. Woe to those who draw sin along with cords of deceit and wickedness as with cart ropes. To those who say, let God hurry, let him hasten his work so we may see it. The plan of the Holy One of Israel, let it approach. Let it come into view so we may know it. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. 
Woe to those who are heroes at drinking wine and champions at mixing drinks, who acquit the guilty for a bribe but deny justice to the innocent. Therefore, as tongues of fire lick up straw and as dry grass sinks down into the flames, so their roots will decay and their flowers blow away like dust. For they have rejected the law of the Lord Almighty and spurned the word of the Holy One of Israel. Therefore, the Lord's anger burns against his people. His hand is raised and he strikes them down. The mountains shake and the dead bodies are like refuse in the street. Yet for all this, his anger is not turned away. His hand is still upraised. He lifts up a banner for the distant nations. He whistles for those at the ends of the earth. Here they come swiftly and speedily. Not one of them grows tired or stumbles, not one slumbers or sleeps, not a belt is loosened at the waist, not a sandal strap is broken. Their arrows are sharp and all their bows are strung. Their horses' hooves seem like flint, their chariot wheels like a whirlwind. Their roar is like that of the lion. They roar like young lions. They growl as they seize their prey and carry it off with no one to rescue. In that day, they will roar over it like the roaring of the sea. And if one looks at the land, there is only darkness and distress. Even the sun will be darkened by the clouds. God is pulling his people out of the nations. He has sent his witnesses. They are harvesting his people. But those who do not return and do not fulfill the covenant that he has outlined in his word picking up their daily cross, leaving everything in the world to follow him, being single-minded, not being friends with the world, returning to the purity of his word, obeying him, being moved by his spirit. You have to be moved by his spirit to follow his laws and keep his decrees. That's what the word says. If that's not happening, You are at risk of being here during the Antichrist reign. Don't be afraid of dying before that. Because if you're here during that and you're actually in him, the persecution is going to be so intense. You're not going to want to be alive. You're not going to be here living a good life. You will have to go through the fire in order to be purified, made spotless, and refined. So examine yourself. Make sure that there's not a lukewarm place in you. God says of that time, because people would have killed his prophets by that time, they would have rejected everything that he was sending and not returned to him, continued in their magic arts. And so what does God say of that time during the Antichrist reign? If they are to go into captivity, into captivity they will go. If they're to die by the sword, by the sword they will be killed. And I am aware that people hate this message. They hate this message. They don't want to hear it. But if you have been given eyes to see, ears to hear, a heart to understand, hang on to that and examine yourself. Pray that he will keep you. Pray that he will hold on to you. And you hold on to him. That needs to be the most important thing we're doing every day until he comes. Because the time is very short. And I want to tell you something else. I have COVID right now. And I made a video prior to this where I was having a really difficult time getting through the video because I'm kind of short of breath right now. I don't know if you noticed that, that I'm more breathy in the video. I keep having to pause it. And my, my chest is tight. And as... God was talking to me about the video. I got right on and and went ahead and did the video. And then I, I realized he convicted me that I needed to do the video again. I want you to know the reason I'm sharing that with you is, first of all, he has allowed me to get through this video more easily than that previous video. But the main reason I'm telling you this is because I know that this message is important to him. I know that it's important to him that I spoke it correctly and I jumped into it too quickly in that previous video. That's why he made me do it again. I want you to know that because I, he is telling me that this is important. 
And to be honest, my COVID is not that bad. It, I mean, I am having some tightening and difficulty breathing and I'm not scared. I know that God speaks through this. He's already spoken through it to me earlier today. And right now, I really believe that part of the reason why he gave this to me was just to slow me down, keep me low so that I could share this message. And I'm okay with that. That's how he works with me. That's what he has me doing. I'm his. He can use me however he wants. He's given me fairly mild symptoms. Last night, I had some flu-like symptoms, some aching. And today, I've got this. So he's just keeping me really low. And when I start to feel my symptoms kind of increase in a particular way, I know that he's speaking. I sit down. I write about what's going on. I listen for the metaphor, the parable that he is speaking, what he's calling me in to address. Once I've done that, the symptoms remit. I'm telling you, that is what he's doing. He has designed us according to his will. But I really pray, I really hope that you take this message very, very seriously. Be grateful, you know, celebrate this day, praise God, glorify him, be grateful for every single thing. If there's food on your table, be grateful that that food is on your table because there is coming a time when food is going to be incredibly scarce. It's already starting, right? We already see it, but we haven't seen anything yet. There is coming a time when you look out your window, there's not going to be all that greenery. The earth is going to be harmed, just like I talked about in the Song of the Vineyard. And if one looks at the land, there's only darkness and distress. Even the sun will be darkened by the clouds. If you have freedom right now, you've been blessed with freedom, use it wisely. Don't misuse it. Understand that that freedom was given to you by blessing. And that there are things that you have to do in order to continue to enjoy that freedom. Understand that when that freedom is removed, when God's people are spurning him and it's removed, that there are a lot of things that history can tell us. Their books start to be burned. They're not able to worship God freely. They're not able to observe his Sabbaths. If you have freedom to observe Sabbath, observe it. If his voice is still talking to you, listen. If he's still allowing you to enter his rest, enter it. Use your freedom correctly. If you're able to say certain words, use certain words. You realize in certain parts of the world, people are not allowed to listen to this video. People are not allowed to use certain words verbally by email they're not allowed to meet and have Bible study together, to sing hymns, to share a word, to encourage each other. Those are blessings. It is a blessing for us to be able to call someone up on the phone and say, God is encouraging me. Let me tell you what he's saying to me. There are parts of the world where people can't do that. If you have that freedom, use it wisely. Use it correctly and use it the way God said to use it encourage the body of Christ. Call up your fellow believers. Tell them what God is sharing with you. Share your faith. Defend your faith. If you're in a country where you have free speech, not everyone has that. I am in a country where I can speak with unashamed and bold truth. And I am blessed because God's put that on my lips. And you hear in the videos that I don't waste that freedom, not because man has given it to me, but because God has given it to me. I pray that this message has reached your heart, that the Holy Spirit will testify to it, speak into it, and build you according to his will. Thank you so much for listening. God bless you. Happy Independence Day to everyone, whether wherever it is that you are in the world, not just in the U.S., and I will see you in the next video.